This is a true story. It didn't happen to me, but to my friend back in 2009. It's a really scary story and it's stuck with me all these years, so I wanted to share it here. I'm going to try to retell the story as best I can. So my friend, who we'll call Kate, had a friend over and they were home alone at her parents' house. They were in the living room on the ground floor which had big windows going from the floor to the ceiling on one side and a sliding door which led to the front lawn with some trees and the main road close by. They had neighbours but they did live a little outside town, so not really a crowded place. Kate and her friend were chilling on the sofa facing the windows, chatting and relaxing, when suddenly a man walks up to the windows. He's wearing nothing but a pair of ripped jeans shorts. This was during the summer break in the middle of the day. He stands there for a little while just staring at them before he suddenly grabs a hold of the sliding door and tries to open it. Kate and her friend got really spooked but sat there frozen just watching the man. Thankfully the door was locked so he couldn't get in. When the door wouldn't open the man starts knocking on the door harder and harder while staring at the girls before he stops and backs up a few steps. He then picks up some rocks and starts throwing them at the windows. When Kate told me this story she said that at this point she was getting seriously freaked out and her mind panicked. She couldn't move, she was so scared. The man then stops again and starts looking around. He spots something to the right and starts moving towards it. Kate didn't understand it at the time, she was so panicked, but the man had spotted the front door which was located on the right side of the house, and he was moving fast. Thankfully her friend had a better reaction than Kate. When she told me this she said her friend jumped over the back of the sofa and sprinted to the front door, and she managed to lock it in time before the man reached it. He still grabs the doorknob and tries to open it, but to no use. He stands there for a few seconds before he grabs a bike they had outside and rides away. Kate and her friend were so scared, trying to understand what had just happened. A little while later the police showed up. I'm not sure if they called them or if the police were checking with nearby houses if they had seen anything, because apparently that man had just escaped from a psych ward and the police were looking for him. The girls were so lucky he didn't get in the house. They have no clue what his intentions were, if he was just looking for a place to hide or something else. Some days later, after she told this story, the incident was written about in the local newspaper. The man had eventually been found by the police and was now back where he escaped from. It didn't say anything about why he was at a psych ward in the first place, and it had no mention of Kate or her friend or what happened to them, just that the man was found. This is a pretty long story. It happened over the span of two months, so I'll try to keep it as short as possible. In 2016, a friend of mine, Max, had invited me to go to a kickback. I had just gone through a breakup and didn't really want to go out or do much of anything, but I figured what's the worst that could happen? Max had been trying his hardest to get me out of my depressed state. While there, I noticed this guy, we'll call him John, staring at me a lot. I'd see it out of the corner of my eye, but thought maybe I was imagining it. John was Max's new friend. They had just met less than a month ago. During this kickback, Max and I ended up planning our first cabin trip to Big Bear. Max had invited his friends, Geoffrey, Manny and John. I invited my two friends, Kat and Chris. The trip was set for two months later, so we spent the two months getting to know Max's friends. John would do random things that would bother me. He always wanted to be near me and would opt to ride with me when the chance was given. Whenever we would go to a restaurant, he would choose to sit next to me and his leg would rub up on mine. It made me uncomfortable, but I just chalked it up to, he's a heftier guy, he needs space. I'm a little weird with being touched. I was lurked on by a paedophile for ten plus years of my life. For years I've been trying to train myself on not freaking out when somebody touches me and I'd tell myself it was normal. But something about John always felt off. The feeling I'd get around him, the slightest touch, everything he'd do, something inside me would always tell me get away. I'd think maybe I'm just being extra paranoid due to my past. At some point I was in his garage with Max and Geoffrey, when Max left to have a talk with Geoffrey, leaving me alone with John and his drunk dad. 
His dad says, It's so cool you guys are going on a trip to Big Bear. You guys are so cool I wish I had friends like that when I was a kid. John walked behind the stool I was sitting on and placed his hand on my mid-back and said, Yeah, Dad, we're going to have a lot of fun. I get it, not much of a big deal, but I don't like to be touched, especially when I just met the person a month ago and we never even shared so much as a hug. At some point in a group setting, I was talking about someone who had a Facebook account. John asked me if I could search the person on his phone so he could see who it was. I took his phone and tapped on the search bar, and guess who his top search was? Me. At this point, I'm kind of sketched out by his behaviour over the past month, but again, it wasn't all a big deal, at least not yet. A couple of weeks later, we went to a park late at night with friends. Jeffrey had walked off with his friend to have a talk, leaving me alone with John. I was nervous, but tried not to show it. I hear John say, Uh, I'm going to go for a quick walk. And he took off. I got into my car, locked the doors and rolled the passenger window down in case he came back. That's when I heard him talking to people. I look over and he's talking to three guys. Who are you with? They ask. He points over towards me. I'm with Kitty. She's really fucking hot. Oh, really? That's a nice car. Let me go and talk to her. Now, man, I'm trying to get at her. And with that, I rolled my window up and turned my car on. I don't live in the safest city. I don't know these three random guys or what they think of a hot girl sitting alone in her car at night. So if I needed to rush out, my car was on and ready. About a minute later, I hear tapping on my window. It's John. I'm going to go home. And with that, he left. I'll say it once more. Nothing too insane had happened yet. Just little things over the course of two months that snowballed into me not being comfortable around him. So I would try to keep a five-foot radius. During this whole period, his staring never stopped. I found it strange, no matter who was talking, his focus was always on me. After every event happened, I would tell Max, and each time he would tell me to chill out and I was overreacting. His friends would tell him similar stories and how uncomfortable they were around John, but he would tell them they were tripping out and to give John a chance. The park event was the final story that I'd told Max, and to my disappointment Max responded with, Stop trying to criminalise John. He is not doing anything wrong. And with that I stopped telling him anything. He was bent on protecting John. The day of the cabin came and I drove with my two friends, Kat and Chris, in the back seat of my car. I had told them my concerns about John, and they said they'd both already noticed John acting weird towards me and even Kat. We agreed to stick together in case something happened. Well, the second night, Jeffrey drank too much earlier that day and was chilling out on the couch. I decided to stay up and keep an eye on him, to make sure he didn't try to drink any more. So I stayed laying on my side on the opposite side of the couch, my dog laying on beside me. I was so tired, it was about 3am at this point, and here I was babysitting my dog and this guy I just met two months prior. Suddenly I hear footsteps coming down the stairs. Heavy footsteps. Honestly, at this point I knew who it was, and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't scared. John had done cocaine earlier that day, and I didn't know what his state of mind was. He walked towards us and grabbed a chair that was facing the TV, turned it around so that it would face us, and moved the chair directly in front of me, about five feet away, and with that he took a seat and stared at me. This is going to sound so childish, but my only reaction was to slowly pull my blanket over my head and hide. All I could think was, this is not happening, I'm dreaming. I must have fallen asleep because the next thing I heard was Geoffrey saying, what are you doing? And John responded, don't worry about it, go back to sleep. A few minutes passed and I hear John get up and walk up the stairs. That morning Geoffrey pulled me to one side and asked if I remember what happened last night with John. I told him I thought it was a dream and he reassured me it wasn't. He told me John sat there for a good ten minutes staring at me before he asked him what he was doing. When we left the cabin I told Kat and Chris about it. Chris let me know that John peeped into his bedroom and was looking at Kat as she slept. But then John noticed Chris was still awake and glaring at him, so with that John pulled back and closed their bedroom door. After that I never spoke to John again, never went near him, and haven't seen him since. Max tried his hardest to get me to hear John out, told me it wasn't what I thought it was, what I saw wasn't really what happened. 
even told me Geoffrey took his version of the story back, claiming Geoffrey said he was drunk and didn't know what he saw. I'm sure he was just trying to avoid confrontation. I refused to see John again or hear him out after that. Slowly but surely, Max's other friends refused to be around John due to their own experiences with him. Max remained in contact with him, but now he keeps his contact with John to a minimum due to how much worse he's gotten. I don't know what his intentions were had Geoffrey not been there. I don't know if people would be scared of this story, but this was a real encounter of a strange man walking into a full clothes store. It was summer, and there were lots of people out and about, and the sun was shining. It just hit 3pm, and working hours were peaking for a bit. My name is Sunny, and I worked in a charity store as a volunteer. My job is simple. Collect the donated clothes, put them out, help people if they are looking for certain things, and show them the way out. As a 16-year-old at the time, I was still learning about how to deal with customers and being in a work environment, etc. So it was 3pm and people were coming and going. Eventually at 3.30pm the store was empty. I went into the staff room. In the staff room is a small toilet washroom. My boss came out of nowhere and told me she was going to use it. There's another door that leads to the main toilet which had a sink and boxes and boxes of books and toys. She goes in and suddenly a strange man appears. He had white hair, scars all over his face, and he was grinning like a monster. It looked like his chin had a little hair on it. He walked in with his hands in his pockets, then began walking around the room. He stopped in the female section, took out his right hand and held the fabric to his nose and began to smell it. He gave out a big sniff, then he did the same to a big purple shirt. I was spying on him from behind the door frame, and all of a sudden he turned his head and looked at me. His eyes were stealing at me with cold blood, and he coughed and spluttered water all over the floor. I was screaming inside and hid inside the staff room, hoping he wasn't going to come for me. I had the courage to spy on him again, and this time he was near the men's section. He was smelling the jeans from the leg to the crotch. But the creepiest part of it all was when he went to the women's lingerie and was smelling them. All of them. I'm talking about ladies' lingerie and girls' lingerie too. I was still watching him at this point and he was still grabbing them and smelling them. He was smirking while he was doing it too. Then I heard a flush from the toilet and my boss came out. She gave me a smile and said she had to make a phone call. I moved myself to the staff room door to make it look like I was working, as she goes nuts if I just stand around doing nothing, and I disappeared to the blue back door to the open. I smiled and was cheering inside to myself. Suddenly I could hear breathing and I could feel a cold breath on me. I turned my head and his face was inches away from mine. His cold, red eyes were steaming into me. His scars were kind of open and his teeth looked like fangs. I fell to my knees, letting out a scream. He stared straight at me and he said, I'm looking for a particular film. I nodded uncontrollably and he came in and said, Where is it? I took a brave, deep breath and showed him the DVD section. He took a DVD from the stand, stared at me and grunted. I ran back to the staff room, gasping with air. My boss came in the room and finally asked me if I was okay. I pointed towards the creepy guy and told her what had happened. She nodded and took her phone out of her pocket as she walked out the room, and he was gone. I have a family that lives up in Ocala, in a really cool mobile home that's right across from a forest. Ocala is full of forests and trees. I would always go up there and visit my cousins and occasionally spend the night if I was able to. This particular occasion was around the time when I was nine or ten years old. My parents drove my brother and I to my cousin's house for a birthday party. The birthday parties we throw aren't like normal parties. We basically just hang out. I was with my cousins and the adults were in the other room. When I went into my cousin's room they were both playing dolls so I joined them. It was pretty fun and we played for about an hour, then we started dancing. 
When I stood up, I took a glance out of the window and saw a man standing in the woods across from the house. I couldn't see him clearly, but all he did was stand there and stare into the window of the room we were in. As I was taking a closer look, he tilted his head to the side and smiled, and asked both of my cousins who that man was out there. They told me that it's normal and he's just some random guy that usually stands there and watches them. I don't know what they were thinking, saying it's normal. To me, it was really creepy. Apparently sometimes he just stands in that exact same spot and just watches both of them. I eventually shrugged it off, given that I was still young and I didn't really know any better. Later on, when we went outside to play a few games, the man had gone. I kept glancing towards the woods and still there was nothing there. We continued talking and playing and we were told I was able to spend the night with them. Later on, about 9pm, my parents left to go to a hotel and everyone else in the house was asleep except for me and my cousins. We were just talking until we heard a loud sound from outside. When we looked out through the window, the same man from earlier was standing in the exact same spot as before, just staring at us. I told them to turn off the lights as I closed the curtains and made sure the windows were locked. We slept really close to each other for the rest of the night. I haven't seen the man since that time. When I go up there now, the first thing I always check is the spot in the woods where that creepy man would stand. I'm very new here, and this is my first story. I'm actually going to be telling three true stories that I believe are related. I hope you enjoy them. To start, I would like to explain the area these stories take place. I lived most of my life in a small southern Kentucky town called Harlan. Some of you may know it as Bloody Harlan from the mine strikes years ago. My stories take place in a particular place that we have always called Black Joe. I'm not really sure where it got its name though. It was a little piece of land that my alcoholic grandfather owned and had built a house on. Alcoholism must have run in the family, as some of my uncles were also dependent on alcohol, resulting in a lot of negative energy, even after the drinking stopped. I witnessed many bad things in that place throughout my childhood. We always said the place was cursed. Beside the house was a gravel road that we called Burger's Road, because our neighbour who lived there was named Bill Burger. My family and I walked the road a lot and explored the mountains surrounding it. It was a different world up there being surrounded by nature. I always felt it was magical. The first story I'd like to tell started when I was almost too young to remember. I was about three or four years old. My mother told me that I had two imaginary friends. I had named them Dagdak and Dodo. I know, really weird names, but I was a very small kid. I would always tell stories about them going into the woods and getting hammered in the head by a witch, or being killed by her in other different ways. Fast forward to when I was about ten years old, bringing us to the second story. There was some logging work being done behind Berger's house, and sometimes my mum would take me for walks exploring the new roads the logging trucks had made. We went pretty far along the road and deeper into the mountains, and came upon an old shack. Immediately I thought of the witch I had talked about as a little kid, and I felt like this was her house. I told a cousin once about seeing it, and he said he saw it once too, and went inside and saw chicken feet hanging from the ceiling, though I'm not sure how truthful that was. Time passed by and we moved from my small hometown in Kentucky to a small town in Virginia, and I had almost forgotten about these stories. It wasn't until I moved back to Harlan as an adult that I thought about them again. When my son was about three years old, I had moved back to my grandfather's house at Black Joe. One day I decided to take him for a walk up Burgers Road. By this point, Bill had moved away and someone had already burnt his house down, so all that was left at the end of the road was some parts of block foundation. We walked the curvy gravel road, playing and having a good time. We finally reached the end where Bill's house used to be and played on his old foundation a bit before we went to the tree line to enter the mountains. Suddenly his demeanour changed and he clung on to me tightly. No, Mommy, I want to go home, he whined. What's wrong, baby? I asked. My heart started racing a bit. He seemed suddenly scared. That monster, he said, pointing deeper into the woods. I looked around and saw nothing, but I started feeling a sense of dread. As I walked with him down the foundation and back to the road, trying not to act freaked out, 
I started asking him some questions. So what does it look like? It's black, he replied. I started to feel like something was watching me. What does it do? I asked before we got to the end of the rough part of the gravel road that blocked out the foundations behind us. It eats little boys, he said. What he said freaked me out so much. I felt he was too little to be saying things like that. When we finally go to the road, he changed back into the happy, playful boy he was before. He didn't act scared or say anything else about monsters the rest of the walk home. He is now almost eight and I've asked him many times about what he saw, but he says he can't remember. I just wonder if it was the witch of Black Joe Hollow that he saw, or something else. Something worse. I told my uncle this story once and he said he was out drinking with his buddies one night and they had pulled a truck back to where the foundation was and was having a good time until they heard something in the woods. He said that something was bending the trees and when they tried to start the truck they couldn't get it going. They all had to push it and it started as soon as they got back on the gravel road. He also said he believed it was a separate monster from the witch, but I feel like it has something to do with her.